Good morning and welcome uh, to us here today in London. And it's a FS Club webinar on the resurrection of entrepreneurship, its role in ESG, ESG being environmental, social and governance. But we might be throwing E's around a little bit today and we're delighted to have with us Professor Bob Garrett. Bob, as many of you know, is a renowned expert on corporate governance and uh, as we were talking here in the green room, a piece of living history. I think he's going to hit me if I'm not careful. Uh, <laughs> but it's great to see Bob. Bob's appeared uh, before and uh, most famously uh, the great title of one of his books, you know, The Fish uh, Rots from the Head. Now, uh, we're going to be getting going today. Uh, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. Uh, and it really is a privilege to introduce these webinars because we are able to range widely and freely across techno technology, economics, and finance. And within all of that, governance is absolutely crucial. And governance has really risen up the agenda over the last uh, 30 to 40 years, whether you want to talk about Cadbury reviews or Hempel or whatever. But we still struggle with this concept. Uh, and it's very interesting in meetings when people start banding around the term governance, just simply ask them, what exactly do you mean? Uh, we could go back to the ancient Greek and look at the uh, models of cybernetics, all of which use sailing analogies, navigation uh, as the basis of what governance is, so keeping the ship on course. Uh, but who sets the course? So where are we going? Why are we going there? How do we know if we're on or off? Uh, what's the difference between governance and management? These are all issues. And now, of course, they're turning up as they would, would quite rapidly. In, in reams of paperwork, whether it's lawyers or accountants coming in at you from the side, listings and rating agencies, government bodies, or even uh, the ISO standards uh, such as 37,000, or one could include 9,000, 14,000, and several others. So it's a big and rich area, and Bob has been a renowned commentator on it and has always been trying to bring us back to basics. Anyway, today's program, uh, I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as I can. Uh, Bob is going to speak for 20, maybe to, uh, 20 minutes or so, but we've got a lot of time for questions and answers, and we have a, a renowned expert here to do so. So three quick things. Uh, firstly, uh, yes, the slides are being posted. Secondly, it is being recorded, and this will go up uh, probably uh, over the weekend. So Monday morning, it will be available to share with friends and family, uh, if that's the sort of thing you do with your family in the evenings. And finally, uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is all the stuff uh, that you type into the Q&A will be sent to Bob with your email attached. So if you want to contact Bob about something specific or you'd like to point something out or engage a conversation, just do it. We'll hand all that over to Bob and he will have everything there uh, to deal with. Now, um, just to get things started, uh, Bob and I wanted to kind of get a question to, to, to launch off. We're going to launch a small poll question here about ESG. So in your opinion, is ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and the whole rhetoric surrounding it, a total game changer for boards, or is it just a total fad? Uh, answers on a uh, screen, please. We don't have postcards here. Over half the audience has voted, Bob, by the way. Uh, okay. We have great opinionated audience out here. Uh, we're gonna shut the poll in just a split second. Uh, there we go, and present the results. So with nearly the entire audience voting, 69% uh, it is a total game changer and 31% is a total fad. Uh, and I'll declare it myself as being moving from game changer to fad uh, over the last few years, but we'll come on to all of that in a, hopefully a very rich discussion. So with no more ado, if I may, Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm a bit worried that twice in the last two months, Sally, my wife and I who work together have been uh, introduced as living history. But um, I take that as a backhanded compliment. Uh, certainly for 40 years, I've been working in this area. And the um, I was actually working on the development of organizations and particularly the development of action learning in major organizations uh, internationally uh, with uh, Adrian Cabri. Uh, this is before the Cabri report. And when Adrian um, was then asked to begin to uh, pull together the team to uh, create the Cabri report, uh, uh, it was very interesting that uh, the word corporate governance wasn't really around, or the phrase corporate governance wasn't around at all. Um, and then at the very end of his life in 2015, he and I were talked frequently. We also corresponded every three months or so 
wonderful longhand letters. And the point he made when I was writing my last book was to say, well, for God's sake, please make sure that corporate governance is rebalanced away from the focus on codes and uh, the, uh, the whole legislation side and the development of regulators. And all, the, the essence of corporate governance is entrepreneurship. That unless we have people with bright ideas who are willing to take uh, exciting um, notions forward, particularly exciting projects forward, then we're running into trouble. And he was very, very worried that we'd overbalance the whole corporate governance um, uh, notion towards the fact that it's only about finance, that it's only about regulation, that it's only about various forms of reporting. And he reckoned that was a complete nonsense. So the work I've been doing recently builds on that very notion <clears throat> that the uh, word entrepreneurship itself comes from the French, uh, the stager of dramas, the person who puts on dramas. And for me, um, the whole notion of the board being the lead or the stager, the uh, uh, producer of dramas and the chief executive being the director that then follows them through um, is absolutely crucial to the work I do. May I have the next slide please? And ESG has sort of come out of really the dreaded CSR, the uh, notion of corporate social responsibility, which was a very nice idea that uh, there, uh, that all uh, organizations, public, private, state, etc., do have uh, impacts on um, their uh, customer base and their stakeholder base, as it became known, um, and obviously on the environmental base. And that, um, but that was seen pretty much as a softy wimp sort of idea. Um, it was very nice to have, and if you had uh, surplus cash of any sort, then you could begin to indulge in that area. And the whole industry of CSR began to grow up. This seems to have morphed into the notion of ESG, that environmental, social, and governance is actually a harder edge version of that. And we are now beginning to see, and just through the recent COP conferences and everything else, much harder numbers beginning to come out. Um, the, the board, each board will have some sort of impact on the physical environment in which it is operating, on the social environment in which it's operating, and that it needs to begin to pull its act together much better in creating a governance context than what Michael said about the Greeks, and I go right back to that. Governance being, on the one hand, steering, showing direction, and on the other hand, ensuring that you have proper um, control. He mentioned cybernetic control uh, to ensure that if you think you know where you're going, you have ways of checking out that you are going there. Um, <clears throat> and those notions are beginning to come through. But we've already seen that degenerate in all sorts of ways when the very people I've just criticized about um, back end loading uh, codes and regulations and all the rest of it start then trying to put their notions of what the right uh, elements are that should be uh, monitored and then begin to put their figures on those. And uh, we then get an ab reaction to that. So we get uh, uh, issues like greenwashing now coming through quite strongly that people are beginning to say, oh, well, if that's a new game, fine. <clears throat> we can just tweak some of the things we're doing in, say, finance, and now claim that we're um, part of this uh, green movement, the physical environment impacts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's just a nonsense. And it's already um, demeaning quite a lot of the notion of ESG uh, as it's around. So I'm very interested in trying to move back into an area where the board is responsible under the law for the continuation and development of its own company. And that it has to be seen much more now, not as a purely financial activity, but as an activity where the board is trying to balance its impact on the physical environment, its impact on the social environment, and create much higher levels of decent governance, effective governance to, to deliver that. And like it or not, boards are being held accountable um, in various ways, both by the public and by the legislators and increasingly the regulators, to uh, move in that direction. So the board is sitting in an ecology 
um, of powers and it plays its own role in that ecology by which it either lives or dies. So that's the basic notion I have around ESG. And in the last few weeks, we've had a very interesting uh, uh, development where people are beginning to ask me, well, okay, we, we pretty much get a feel of what E might be, but we are very, very puzzled now by S and what that means. It could mean everything or nothing very much. Um, uh, and one of the questions I've been asking them is, well, does S now include defense? Because with the current wars going on, you know, is it okay for a board now to begin to say, as part of the notion we have of developing our social values, um, it is okay to, uh, in certain circumstances, to begin to operate in the defense field, which has been almost a no-no for a long time. Um, so these questions are, are very topical, are very lively, and, and are certainly not resolved at the moment. Um, but the national governments and the pressure groups are exerting those pressures. May I have the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> and therefore, we're getting new metrics. Uh, uh, and it's a challenge. Um, a lot of people don't um, realize that we've been operating for about 200 years with a, a very simple notion of the for corporate unlimiteds. Um, it's just been assumed that a corporation, when it's set up, will have unlimited size, will have unlimited life, will have unlimited license to do whatever it feels like, and will therefore have unlimited power. And we're seeing pressures now on from all sorts of uh, sides uh, on what is the appropriate size for a particular type of organization. Should um, uh, organizations have unlimited life or should they have time bound licenses to operate, uh, which is coming through in a number of countries now, uh, begin to say that do, the, the corporation is not a, uh, doesn't have unlimited license, it doesn't have unlimited power. And increasingly, if you're operating in our country, then you need to have a contract with us about what you're doing, what size you'll be, how long you'll be with us, and what you're actually going to do. And these questions are, are big, I would say, ESG questions, which um, have hardly uh, touched the, uh, the general debate in the area. Um, so uh, we're reopening the notion of human duties there. And one of the changes I've made, in fact, the only change I've made to my learning board model in 20 years is to say that the, is the board not only is the business brain, the, the central processor of the business, but increasingly, and many boards don't like this, um, increasingly is the conscience of their company as well. And that they have to be quite clear as to the values uh, within which they will operate. So what is their purpose? How will they strategically deploy their assets? Um, all of it under public gaze. And that is something which uh, many of the boards I deal with at the moment are still trying to come to terms with. Many of them don't like it, but they're beginning to accept. And that may be why we got the uh, score we've just got um, uh, from the uh, simple poll, um, that we've got to begin to face up to this in the future. May I have the next slide, please? Bob, as you go on to that, we've got a, a question here from uh, Simon Webb, if you don't mind. I think it's appropriate to take it now. Uh, how can boards be sure they're getting reliable data on ESG to the standards uh, provided uh, by finance directors for financial performance? Yeah, we've got no problem with financial numbers. They, they cannot at the moment. Um, however, what I would refer you to is some of the work that's going on. I've got this at the very end, but I'll, I'll mention part of it now. Um, I refer you to the development of uh, the ISO 37000. Um, which is a very interesting document. I'm not normally, you will gather, very keen on such documents, or certainly on such codes, etc. but I would refer you to it because it's not a mandatory code. It's an advisory document on how one might begin to look at the metrics and the dimensions that are developing in this area. And there's one other one, which I'll come on to at the very end of the session then, sure. And another quick uh, question uh, from Sharon Constanson. Uh, Sharon's asking, where can we source the updated learning board model? What's the best source for that? Um, well, I hope it's in the book uh, 
that I'm going to publish in about six months' time called um, Shining a Light on a Naughty World. Good. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's in the press, or will shortly be in the press. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Let you go on there. Fine, fine, fine. And then what I'm suggesting here, but I'm not going to go into this in any detail, is that the mindsets that are beginning to develop around some boards, but have certainly been debated much more widely, of this notion of EES, so that's enterprise, environment, and social, plus effective government. Uh, um, we're seeing, uh, I think, uh, a diminishing of the notion of shareholder supremacy, which does now seem to be very much on the way out. And uh, with that, uh, the absolute financial supremacy. This does not mean to say that we cheerfully go bust or anything, but the, uh, the, the, the huge focus that the Chicago School and others put on, particularly sh uh, shareholder supremacy, um, is now dying, and along with it, CEO supremacy. Um, the listed company focus, the uh, number of companies listing, although still rising on many exchanges, is uh, in relative terms quite small at the moment. And we're beginning to see alternative forms of finance uh, beginning to come out, way away from the notion of share capital. Uh, and we're beginning to see changes I've just mentioned, current accounting and audit practice, ISO 37000 is part of that, and the work Mervyn King is doing, which I'll mention later, is a major part of that now. Um, we're beginning to see, um, I think, the uh, end of fund management as we know it. Um, I'm assuming that uh, we're almost certainly going to see fund manager management shrink by possibly up to 90% over the next decade. Um, as uh, exchange traded funds and all the other things that are coming through there and I recommend the work of uh, Marion Somerset Webb particularly on uh, her ideas of how uh, fund management is going to exist. Um, I got really taken to pieces on this on Tuesday I was giving a talk at a parliamentary uh, meeting and the fund managers got most upset about this but none of them were able to say why they should continue in their present manner. Um, and particularly why they should charge the present fees they charge. Um, and that, that was an interesting debate. It was a standoff um, on Tuesday. Uh, but income, I think the notions of the stakeholder and stakeholder supremacy, it's a, a much more diverse group of power players now able to influence boards and companies. The idea I've already mentioned of limited licenses to operate, annual assessments of entrepreneurship, environmental and social impact, and government, so therefore EESG coming through in uh, more uh, uh, metrics uh, on those, and those are forming. Um, and they'll be integrated into new types of accounting and audit, as I've already mentioned. Um, what intrigues me, and I've spoken before with Michael about this, is we're beginning to see a next generation of funders coming through. Um, and I can say this towards the end again, uh, the 35 to 45 year olds who are now beginning to influence um, investment decisions in their own organizations. And they seem to have a very different mindset where ESG, um, for all its obvious current faults and its uh, uh, still developing form, is much closer to their hearts than the present um, uh, shareholder supremacy model that we've seen before. Um, and that's beginning to have some very interesting effects. And this notion of the great wealth transfer, um, which the, uh, that generation is beginning to uh, influence, which will go on over the next 10 to 15 years, is I think something which will really push a more sophisticated model of ESG to the forefront. May I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so um, uh, just take the middle section there. Um, so my general concern is that um, as we enter the 21st century, we've created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions. Need I mention the current wars, etc. Medieval institutions and godlike technology. We are terribly confused by the mere fact of our existence. And so we are a danger to ourselves and others. That's E.O. Wilson, who died very recently. The Social con uh, Congress of the Earth. What interests me about um, ESG is I think it focuses very much on the development of those medieval institutions into something modern. 
and in doing that begins to put the Stone Age emotions into a rather more modern context and begins to uh, uh, get some control over the godlike technology which is developing. Can I have the next slide, please? But it won't happen until certain very basic things have happened. Um, acceptance that directing is a proper job, quite distinct from managing. And this, in my experience across five of the six continents, is still very rare indeed. Um, the full funding and development of separate selection, induction, personal development, regular confidence assessment, and deselection from boards is the norm, is what's expected of any board. And that notion, again, is very rare. It's beginning to happen. We've had some interesting examples recently, but it's still rare. The personal public commitment of each director to the legal purpose of the board uh, is there, including the notions of their independence and the development of their care, skill, and diligence under the law. Uh, that, again, is uh, beginning to move, but it's, it's slow, but it's across all of the continents I work in now, it is certainly beginning to happen. The personal public commitment of each director to the seven duties of a director, which um, I have partly mentioned in, in the previous thing, but particularly around the notions of independence of thought, uh, uh, personal loyalty first, primary loyalty to the company and to the uh, duties of care, skill and diligence, and then the anti-corruption elements that, uh, in the seven duties of a director. Uh, are absolutely crucial, but they're rarely made so obvious, and people are rarely asked to publicly commit um, uh, as a director to those. And the government and public acceptance that corporate governance must become uh, an integrated system, which at the moment it isn't, where directors, stakeholders, politicians, and regulators can talk with each other and learn from each other under public oversight and we have a stunningly ignorant public at the moment who don't even know what questions to ask of boards and therefore of corporate governance. May I have the next slide please? Um, so the seven duties I mentioned rest above are to try and deal with the director's dilemma because we'll never get it right. How do we drive our organizations forward whilst keeping them under prudent control? But just a reminder that Section 171 of the UK Compass Act, which is persuasive of the um, 54 nations of the Commonwealth and many other nations, the Chinese uh, with whom I work for something like 40 years, um, were denied absolutely, but they rely on things like the seven duties in the development of their own Compass Act um, through the, um, the way in which it has developed in Hong Kong um, to act within their powers. And that is a very interesting one um, indeed, because certainly in the last year, um, I've seen companies beginning to think, hey, just a minute, we, because we can do anything, it means that we, um, we really don't think about this at all. Um, so uh, some of the companies I know now are beginning to actually put back into their articles, a memorandum of association, but particularly into the articles, the objects of their company. An objects clause has really got sort of phased out just as a fashion thing. And now they're beginning to come back because the younger generation, the next generation is saying, well, what the hell are you there for? Can you do anything anytime you like? Or as you have limited resources, can you just say precisely why you are doing things and what it is you're attempting? And thereby to promoting the success of the company, exercising the independent judgment that I mentioned, which is very tricky, particularly if you see yourself um, as uh, simply a cipher for other shareholders or, uh, or parliament or, um, or whatever. Uh, to exercise that reasonable care, skill and diligence, how do we develop ourselves to do that? And then the, uh, the three that deal with the um, nastier side of things, to avoid conflicts of interest, not to accept benefits of third parties and to declare interest in proposed transactions. And all of these things, for me, form a covenant um, for each director when they join a board and that they should actually publicly make a declaration that they will follow that. That is just not done for the most part in most countries. Next slide, please. And so what I'm saying is that I think, and this is part of the new book, there are four levels of board maturity. 
the huge majority, by which I mean over 90% of those I see across the world, and I deal with hundreds of boards and have done over many years, is the accidental board where people actually are nominally on a board but don't realize it. And most people are quite shocked to find they actually have not only duties, but um, there are co legal consequences of those duties. And that um, is, uh, is beginning to be tightened up in many, many countries now. And, and people are, are really quite horrified to find it's not an uh, honorary uh, award, or it's not a little uh, nice uh, extra income at the end of a long career as a manager, but it's actually something rather serious, which leads to the second level, which is the grudgingly compliant board. Well, you know, I was suckered into this and now I've got to obey, but I don't like it at all. And I will moan and complain bitterly that it's a whole, a whole bureaucratic um, setup. Um, and uh, the sooner um, we get rid of it, the better. Uh, those are pretty negative um, sides. The ones that I'm interested in are the ones that then say, actually, the future is going to be, as we've just seen from your vote, very different. Um, and we've got to learn how to do that. And that is a change away from a lot of the um, previous uh, thinking. It's, it's quite a, a, a step change. Uh, uh, what well, we, wanted, we wanted to ask the audience a quick question, didn't we? So I'm just going to yeah, hold sure. so, there. Uh, yeah, the move then is to a professional board. Yeah. So, okay. So where, where would you say your board is at the moment on that, that little um, scale? Okay, folks, so the, the, you got an opportunity to vote. Are you an accidental board, grudgingly compliant, learning, or very professional? Uh, yet again, Bob, over half the audience have voted. I'm just going to leave it open for five more seconds so I can get back on track time-wise. Uh, that's super. Pretty much everybody's there, and I'm now going to share the results. And, uh, oh, wow, uh, the learning board is over half the audience. Uh, that's and grudgingly compliant and professional are uh, running between uh, 10 and 20 percent. So, uh, yeah, 55 that, that is, is a very interesting uh, result because uh, uh, obviously uh, the people tuning in today um, are moving in that direction. I encourage them to continue to do so. But uh, many of the boards I see which are running into great trouble are still back, most probably grudgingly compliant and haven't actually made the investment to, to move forward. Um, okay, well, that's fine. Then uh, if we could go on to, the, thank you for that. If we go on to the next slide, then the, um, the notion um, is that as you become a learning board and as you move towards more professionalism, and I can talk more in the Q&A about that, we, um, we're moving from really the bottom left where the focus of the board members tends to be still very short term, very internal, very figures orientated, very, managerial in many senses um, uh, and the ideal is how do we begin to schedule our time and our resources to spend a lot more time but up in the top right corner so looking out into that external world which is the ESG world as I define it not as the greenwashers and others define it um, and making sure that um, we are beginning to think very long term and we're we're within, we, we have the nimbleness within the ecology to actually be able to position and reposition ourselves quite rapidly to deal with that. Uh, if we look at bottom right strategic thinking, then that's the link between the way we see the external world forming and reforming and the way we begin to deploy our very scarce resources in any organization strategically to allow us to then ask bottom left our managers not to do it ourselves but to have the cybernetic systems to monitor what the management is doing and achieving what's going on um, to achieve our, our strategic end and then ensuring and we must always do so top left that in the external world we are properly accountable and those accountabilities are coming through in various ways now and that's the work for example that Mervyn King is doing um, very well um, uh, with his uh, general, um, uh, the comprehensive uh, global reporting system that he and the UN and others have been working on, and which are beginning to uh, create um, some interest, to say the very least, uh, which I commend hugely um, uh, in moving forward. 
Um, can I have the next slide? That is the detailed version of what I've just said. It is not my intention to slavishly work through that. It's my intention to say, notice that what was the business brain is having to become the business brain and conscience, where we explain both to the people who um, invest in us, but especially and increasingly to those stakeholders in the outside world who are impacted by us, what it is we're doing. And may I have the final slide, please? Um, so watch movements um, as we uh, go into this area. Uh, there is a very interesting international demand now for the accreditation of registered directors. And I am deeply involved in this in some parts of the world, but at the moment I'm very deeply involved in the six nations of the Gulf. Um, and uh, people may be surprised to hear um, really being pushed very strongly by Saudi Arabia um, uh, and by the nine nations of the Caribbean who are in desperate trouble now um, in terms of what their future is going to be. And they're beginning to realize that they're actually going to have to have uh, professional boards, but you can't reach that in one leap. And so there's a, a whole uh, rethink going on about what is the nature of the compliance issues, but particularly what are the nation, uh, the, what's the nature of the learning issues that are going to take people through to that. But it's happening in other parts of the world at all. The generational shift I've mentioned, the Great Wealth Transfer, ISO 3000 I've mentioned, and the Mervyn King work is on the globally accepted comprehensive reporting system, which is a wonderful notion. It's taking a lot of energy, to, uh, but it is moving. And that's a, a very interesting notion that we would all uh, actually be able to come together um, to be uh, observed and monitored in a global system. And then last slide, please. Thanks for listening. And please note, no codes or regulations were used during the making of this presentation. Very good, Bob. <clears throat> well, we've got heaps of questions and limited time, so I have to be a bit sharp and sh uh, short and sharp. Uh, first question from Bob McDowell. To what extent is the changing notion of ESG really Europe focused rather than global and aspiration? Well, I just mentioned um, uh, the work I'm doing currently in the Gulf and in the Caribbean, and that's hugely ESG focused because yeah. they're saying this isn't a fad, this is our future. You know, if you look at the nine nations of the Caribbean, apart from Trinidad, you know, has, has a bit of gas and oil, where on earth do we go from now? Uh, and the answer is, they think, to be found in the way in which we uh, now impact positively on our environment, which in theory is pretty damn good and therefore can be developed, but also the way in which we deal with the um, social imbalances in our societies to make sure that we have a really healthy health system, that we have really good, um, uh, as I say, social uh, processes. Um, through which we can really uh, enjoy the way in which our environmental issues um, are going to be developed. Similarly, in Saudi Arabia, I've been amazed and uh, uh, quite shocked in some ways by what's happening between the uh, eastern side of the country, the Riyads and the bits that everybody thinks they know about, and what's happening in the western side of the country. I'm not talking about Mecca and Medina, but I've recently traveled up to Neom, the new cities, and up to the um, uh, uh, Red Sea resorts and things, where uh, very quietly but extremely quickly they've been building an entirely different Saudi Arabia. Um, it's you know it's, it's full of music and light and women um, uh, able to do whatever they like and uh, and it's an extraordinary thing that's going on and the yeah. ESG is very firmly based in that and certainly although not all of that is publicised at the moment, Neom is in, in as the new city, this huge new city. It is partly publicized, but the Red Sea Resort uh, development is yeah. based entirely on ESG. Yeah, um, and, and of course, uh, King's work, uh, you know, is is emanating to some degree from South Africa and ISO Ooh. 9, sorry, 37,000 global. Yeah. Um, but uh, two, uh, two questions that uh, kind of come together, and it's about the, the scope of this and the what you might call the propensity of take up. Nick Bush is curious, would you say that charity boards 
are more aware of their governance role than commercial ones, as they're likely to be clearer about their social purpose. Uh, and Ian Shackle is kind of curious, you know, does all this apply to SMEs? And he thinks so, but he wonders if many would disagree. Yeah. Okay, the two points. Um, I've been very critical, particularly recently, of charity boards. Um, their social, social purpose is normally very clear. Their objects are normally extremely clear. Um, the problem I had, and you know, this goes back over 20 years now, we, we actually created the Centre for Charity Effectiveness at what was then CAS Business School um, mm -hmm. nearly 20 years ago. Um, and that's done remarkable work, and it, it has produced national and international uh, guidelines uh, for, uh, for creating effective charities. The problem for me, when I'm normally brought in, is obviously when things go wrong. So I'm, I'm biased in that sense. But the problems I see arising are good-hearted people who have normally stayed too long and become deeply emotionally involved in the social side of what they're doing for all the right reasons, but have outstayed their welcome. And then the governance tends to go to hell. Um, and you get really, really difficult issues. Uh, I mean, Kids Unlimited is an obvious example, but there are plenty of others. And whether it's Oxfam or, or whatever, um, you do get these terrible issues where um, because people think they're really doing a good job for a good cause, they don't have to um, obey many of the rules of effective government. And that is just a nonsense. Um, and uh, well, I had a call only three weeks ago from uh, a woman trying to chair a major charity and just in desperation saying, you know, everything we're trying to do is great, but we are failing to do it now because of the internal governance issues of who thinks they still should be on the board, who thinks they are effective, who thinks they um, uh, are, um, uh, sorry, that their projects should have higher priority than other projects. And the whole thing is is becoming really bitter and fragmented. So I'm not anti-charity at all. I'm certainly not anti-pro bono work. I'm you know, past master of one of the livery companies that specializes in pro bono work uh, for charities. But um, I, I find that uh, a, a very difficult area at the moment. Um, and it's one which some of the recent uh, public reports are, are well worth reading. About. Sorry, the second question was, I missed that, SMEs? It was about applicability in SMEs, but I, I'd like to move swiftly on if we can, because we're quite tight on time here. Um, and, I, and I think Ian's point was that, you know, he believes it applies, but some would say not. So um, do I. We've got uh, Angel Gaviero here. Um, how can EESNG come in without first fixing the broken governance conveyor belt? Uh, by which he means, you know, we do have boards and we have asset managers and we have asset owners and we have household owners, you know, with pensions and insurance. So this mm, sure. is a big chain here. Sure. And uh, Richard well, Paul, well, like, so he, he's looking at the conveyor belt, Bob. Um, and then Richard All is asking, yeah, but isn't this just, uh, you know, new old oil, sorry, old oil and new bottles? You know, in the early 2000s, we spoke of the triple bottom line investments that morphed yeah. into CSR, now it's ESG. You know, is there another stage in development? So we've got a broken conveyor belt. And is, is this just the same old argument? Well, it's, I don't know if it's the same old argument. It's the same argument, definitely. And I think it will go on forever. I think it's, you know, it's gone on for three uh, millennia and will continue to, to go on, um, <clears throat> which is why as you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the, the notion of governance or Kubernetes you know, comes out of uh, three millennia old uh, Greek. Um, uh, they were trying to work out how you steer an organization, originally a ship but later an organization, in a way that actually achieves its objectives. And we're still facing up to that. ESG is a mindset change, I think, in the, the fact we now have to consider much, much more seriously the external environment, the changing external environments in which organizations are working, the broken conveyor belt is part of the internal changing environment where things, yeah, things are moving. Um, I mentioned Marin Sunset Webb's work um, particularly. Um, I mean, she wrote that article about five years ago on 
is this the end of farm management as we know it? Um, basically saying 90% of farm managers are already redundant, but haven't quite realized that. And they will continue to be paid until their investors realize that. But with the rise of ETFs and all the rest of it, um, they begin to realize that uh, maybe that part of the game, for the most part, but not entirely, is dead. Um, one of the things I think we see changing, which may be a change in the conveyor belt, is something in which you, Mike, have um, paid some interest, is the notion much more of uh, impact investment um, relating to uh, ESG. And particularly from my experience in uh, infrastructural project investment. Yeah. And but, but, the, but, but, the example of that is King's Cross Development and Argent and Hermes, the way they've got together. And this is a long term investment. Chris Gleedle points uh, out as well, of course, we hear a lot about pur purpose driven uh, companies and purpose driven investments. And Chris is curious. What do you think of the notion that purpose should be more focused as outcome? Well, I'm part of what I just said, I think it covers part of that, is the main part of that, which is I think we're beginning to see now much more project driven investment. So instead of in investing the shares and then hoping things will, will turn out right, uh, people are putting money into very specific investments um, for medium to long term uh, return taking, if necessary, quite serious losses in the first stages, like that Argent investment, where um, you know, the people were pretty damn cynical that that King's Cross area uh, would ever become, quote, a new town. But you know, it's, it's a roaring success, and the finances on it are terrific. But that's happening in many parts of the world now. And the whole notion that, uh, and this is where I think the next generation uh, are much more savvy in this area. The, they don't want to play the markets. They're not interested very much in playing the markets. They're interested in having an impact, having a real tangible effect on what's going on in the environment and in the social uh, setup. Okay. Um, I'd like to weave a few comments together and then end on a question, which I think, well, it's my question, but I think it does touch on many of these. Uh, Robert Suster reminds us that Derek Higgs' report of over 20 years ago is still relevant today. He dealt with simple ideas such as the role a non-executive director should play, how to widen the gene pool, really simple notions, but these got buried in FRC guidelines. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Bob McDowell is, uh, you know, is pointing out that non-execs uh, and even executive directors tend to have shorter tenure. You know, this isn't helping. Hugh Purser points out that you know, perhaps some of the resistance to EESG uh, is really largely down to the current lack of diversity at board level. So maybe that that, that might move. And uh, Bob McDowell is also curious about the non-financial pressures on boards. Are these discouraging people from taking up board positions? Anyway, in all of this, you made a point which really resonated with me. And you said that the acceptance of directing as a proper job quite distinct from managing is really important or we're not going to have EESG. Would you mind just, uh, I, I'd love to go away thinking today, you know, what does Bob mean by the difference between directing and managing? Okay. <clears throat> Again, it comes back to high levels of ignorance amongst very top people. Um, a, a manager um, is someone who takes a very, if you like, a manager is a puzzle solver. So once the issue is identified, the manager within those parameters can work away at getting something solved. <clears throat> the director is a problem poser. And that's a very different notion. The problem is much more environmentally orientated. It's much more you know, how on earth do we begin to face up to these sorts of issues, general issues? So that's in part, if you like, as a shorthand, ESG type issues. Um, whereas a manager is, how do I get the following return out of bang, 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 this sort of scarce resources? And that, that's a very different mindset. It, it creates a very different um, notion about thinking and making the step between often extremely complex managerial problem 
uh, puzzle solving and uh, often even more fuzzy uh, directorial problem posing and problem resolution um, is, is actually very disconcerting. I've done quite a lot of work on the psychology of the thinking processes of people who become directors and many of them are disconcerted by the fact that they cannot live and solve puzzles in the present but have to try and think about a whole range of possible futures none of which may happen or many of which may happen simultaneously or some of which may happen and be totally contradictory to the other elements that they're thinking about and uh, a lot of people find that difficult. They tend to return almost immediately to their managerial thinking style because they invested 20, 30 years in doing so, find it much more easier and know there will be a, a result, even if the result doesn't help develop the future of the organization. Yeah. Um, so it's somewhere in around there. By the way, you know, I also am a violent um, objector to the term non-executive directors which is not a legal term yes. it's a nonsense term and i've always opposed the use of that term it's, you are a director or you're not at law yeah. I, I remember when bob when you were on a, 18 months ago or so you made that point very cogently and very importantly well folks um it, it's always a delight to have bob here and i i always gather in some of these there's a kind of well you know what, what's the new but bob's point is the crucial one this is a recurring thing over three millennia, uh, you know, how do we how do we steer our organizations? And whilst we did delve a little bit into etymology today, I, I was tempted to raise the the old George W. Bush that the French have no word for entrepreneurialism, um, which actually he did he didn't actually say it was attributed to him. Uh, it was just one of those things that fit, I, I feel. Um, but I, I always take the view in this that it's the difference between uh, the navigator and the helmsman. So the navigator is the director setting, setting, setting a course for something that's beyond the horizon that you can't quite yet see, and the helmsman is the manager who is there keeping you on course in a in a in a tighter, narrower uh, domain. But that's me. But Bob, it's been a real delight to have you today. You're always welcome here, and you are reminding us of these eternal debates because they're part of life. Um, now I've got to say thank you to our sponsors. I, I, I'm getting a lot of. Uh, uh, comments here thanking Bob for his presentation so that's good uh, I'd like to uh, thank the audience you've been very vibrant today and as I said all those comments and questions uh, will be passed uh, back to Bob uh, and he can get hold of you if he wishes um, we do have uh, some more things coming up not least uh, Tuesday with the Worshipful Company of Management Consultants <laughs> a really difficult question is management consultancy part of the problem so we'll be continuing I think similar debating issues uh, and we have next week the launch of our Global Financial Centers Index 31, uh, the gift that keeps on giving because it's really interesting. Uh, so we look to see many of you there at that launch. But most importantly of all, Bob, uh, our thanks to you. Um, as you know, we have a little uh, tradition here when we can't open the floodgates of applause. I, I too go back a, a few centuries to a Korean karmic clapper, <laughs> which functions as applause uh, for us, but the audience has really enjoyed today. And we look forward to your book coming out uh, later in the year. Uh, put that in the chat room as well. And we hope to have you uh, on board again. Thanks, uh, Ron. I'd like to keep this history living. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone.